Hi, I'm Lucas Olguni, a PhD student at the European Bioinformatics Institute, and I'm excited to present to you our work today on the dynamic adaptive sampling during nanopore sequencing and assembly using Bayesian experimental design. I split my talk into two presentations, where first I'm going to give a brief overview uh, of adaptive sampling and the key developments in the field and how we expanded to dynamic adaptive sequencing. And then I'm gonna show a real-time application of our uh, new method. And then in the second part of my talk, I will talk about how we adapt the same framework to be able to use it during de novo assembly. First of all, though, I wanna talk about the flaw of untargeted massively parallel sequencing in the context of resequencing experiments or to phrase it differently, why higher coverage, higher average coverage is not necessarily better coverage. So if we think about a resequencing experiment, we usually have some reference genome. And what we're interested in is capturing the variation of the genome in our sample compared to some reference genome. And this variation could be SNPs or larger variants such as CMDs, um, signified here by these black triangles or bigger black boxes. And while we're sequencing, uh, we observe some level of average coverage. But uh, if we consider what we're actually interested in, uh, the ideal coverage might look uh, quite a bit different. So we might uh, want to observe more coverage around these uh, pieces of variation so we can confidently call these variants. However, as we observe more and more coverage, uh, we might not necessarily uh, cover up this ideal coverage. And if we look at um, the zoomed in plot in a little bit more detail, we can see that not only do we miss out uh, where we have large dropouts of coverage, but there might also be these smaller uh, areas where, where despite high average coverage, we might still see low coverage or uh, smaller sites. So if we want to put it bluntly, all of this coverage could be considered waste. And what we're actually interested in is trying to get the coverage that we need to fill in these gaps. Adaptive sampling provides a partial solution to this issue, where uh, if we look at the general sequencing process, we have some DNA fragments translocating through the pore, which then is represented by this uh, squiggle here, and ultimately it gets translated into bases. And adaptive sampling allows us to introduce a decision step in this procedure, where we can either decide to sequence a fragment in its entirety, or we can actually reverse the voltage across the pore and decide to eject the fragment out of the pore. And the key developments in this field were by Luce et al, who introduced this technology under the name of read and fill. So this allows for a priori choice of some regions in a genome. And recently there have been more developments on this, where now uh, it's more efficient and we can actually do the base calling step in real time. And what this allows us to do is optimize the information gain during the sequencing in real time. So we might uh, actually eliminate the need for sample preparation. And in turn, we get reduced time to answer, reduced sequencing cost, reduced coverage bias, for example, or we can increase confidence in variation calling, as I hinted to before. Now, what we introduce with this work is dynamic adaptive sampling where we incorporate already sequenced data. So we have some uh, dynamic decision framework that allows us to focus the sequencing on regions of high uncertainty compared to the reference genome. So we first need to introduce uh, some measure for the uncertainty of um, each site. So this is a measure that combines basically the information that we have about the coverage and about uh, variation at some site. And here's where the experimental design, uh, the Bayesian experimental design part of this project comes in. So we quantify uncertainty at each site and define a score um, of the potential for the reduction of this uncertainty. And the way we model this is by uh, defining a posterior probability distribution um, at each individual position about each genotype. So uh, we basically have this posterior probability that is uh, composed both of the prior information that we have at the site 
so uh, the nucleotide from the reference genome and the counts that we have observed so far. And then we can ask the question, how does this posterior probability distribution change if we observe one more read at that position? And if we then compare these two posterior probabilities by using the kullback leibel divergence as a measure for the entropy at the site, we can derive a score. So this score tells us uh, the propensity of one more observing one more read at this site, reducing the uncertainty that we have about the genotype at that site. Now, if we combine these positional scores over um, some cumulative stretch that a read might cover and uh, take the product of the read length distribution of those read lengths that we have observed so far in the sequencing read, we can actually get the expected benefit, not just of covering a single site, but the expected benefit of a read mapping at that position, which is uh, shown right here. And of course, since uh, reads can have either orientation in forward or reverse, each site has two values for the expected benefit of a read starting at that position. Another part that we need to take care of is the parameterization of the time cost of sequencing a read. So basically, um, we start by acquiring some fragment at the pore, and then we start sequencing um, the fragment until new bases, and we use these initial bases to map the fragment to the reference genome to figure out its starting position and its orientation. And then we can decide to either reject the fragment and wait until a new fragment um, is acquired at the pore. And this adds some constant uh, time cost. Alternatively, we can decide to fully sequence the fragment, which is done in the time of the length of the fragment, basically. And this is where the time saving and the advantage of using a dynamic adaptive sampling comes in. And now if we use these two components, so the expected benefit of reads and the expected time cost of sequencing a fragment, we can then derive a strategy, uh, which we denote with S here. I don't want to go into too much detail about the uh, formula, about the equation, but what we end up with is basically two vectors for the forward and the reverse direction that gives us for each individual site in the genome the decision that we want to make when a read maps to that position. So whether we want to continue sequencing it or whether we want to reject it. Now for implementing this method, we are collaborating with the Luce lab at the University of Nottingham. And this allows us to stream the sequencing data and map it to the reference to make the decision. So we're using their setup of the read until API and their uh, implementation called readfish where we start sequencing the fragment and in real time perform the base calling to then map it very rapidly to the reference genome and figure out where it comes from. And then we can make the appropriate decision and send the signal to the sequencing machine. Simultaneously, we periodically recalculate all of the components to make the dynamic decision strategy to, and to take all of the sequencing data observed up until that point into account. Now I want to show you an applied example where we sequence two species from a microbial community that shows some abundance bias. So we took the Symobiotics microbial community, which is a, a standard with very exactly known abundances of the constituent species. And of this microbial community, we selected the two most abundant species. So this is Listeria and Pseudomonas where Listeria uh, is about one order of magnitude more abundant than Pseudomonas. And out of these genomes, we selected some regions of interest by uh, using the CARP database to select for antimicrobial resistance associated loci, which make up about 10% of the genome. Uh, first, we can look at the size of the dynamically adaptive sequencing strategy. So basically this expresses how many sites the strategy would accept reads from during the sequencing. And we can see for the more abundant listeria on the left hand side that the strategy size decreases very quickly since most of the reference genome is resolved very quickly. On the other hand, um, 
the strategy for pseudomonas stays constantly at 100% for the beginning and only later on um, when more sequencing data from this genome is acquired it uh, slowly also decreases the number of accepted sites. In this experiment we separated the flow cell into four quadrants. So we have one quadrant with our dynamic adaptive strategy um, called boss runs. Then we have two um, quadrants for the implementation of readfish, so the only the a priori choice of fragments. And the last quadrant is a control where we don't perform any adaptive sampling at all. And we can see that we sacrifice lots of coverage for listeria, but in turn, Bostrans gains a lot of coverage for the pseudomonas. However, in the end, we can also see that readfish, so the a priori choice adaptive sampling, actually manages to catch up with uh, Bostrans again. However, if we think back about how higher average coverage is not necessarily better in this case, we can also think about um, the result of the sequencing in terms of the remaining entropy or the remaining uncertainty that we have about genotypes at each site. And here we can see that for the more abundant species, the remaining uncertainty ends up at a very similar level at the end of the sequencing. However, for the less abundant one, we can clearly see that Bostrans manages to achieve the lowest uncertainty at the end. And if we uh, describe this in terms of the sequencing time that we could save, then it is roughly 36% um, of the sequencing that um, compared to the control quadrant, or about 15% of sequencing that we could save over a priori choice adaptive sampling. So to summarize this first part, uh, I talked about how naive untargeted sequencing can lead to wasteful coverage. I don't talked about how read until and readfish provides a partial solution to this issue, but the choice that we have is still based on some a priori choice regions. And uh, third, I introduced boss runs, our method for dynamic adaptive sampling based on Bayesian experimental design, where we incorporate already sequenced data and then manage to focus the sequencing effort on regions of highest uncertainty. And I've shown a real-time application with the microbial community. However, there is one limitation that we have, which is that we need a reference genome in order to um, do all of these computations. Which leads me on to the second point, where we're trying to adapt this same framework, but instead of using it on a linear, linear reference genome, we try to use it on a genome graph. And the goal of this is to reduce the uncertainty that we have about assembled context so we reject fragments from already well-assembled regions, and therefore our ultimate aim is to increase the contiguity and assembly quality, and again, decrease the time to answer. And a quick overview of the process. So we first periodically construct some guide assembly from the uh, sequencing data that has already been collected. We then define again some positional score, so basically some uncertainty using the information that we have about the coverage of the context. And also um, we find the component ends of the context using closeness centrality and give those a higher score. And then as a third step, we can calculate the expected benefit of a read mapping to this genome graph by modeling reads on the graph using the Hashimoto matrix, which is a transition matrix that is not able to backtrack on itself. I again want to show an example, but this time it's uh, from in silico simulations and not from an actual sequencing run. But here we are trying to optimize a de novo assembly of a bacterial species um, using simulated nanopore reads. So we have a 5.6 megabase chromosome and six plasmids of varying length and of varying abundance from which we um, simulate long reads. And if we look at them, most basic uh, metric, the total assembly size, we can see that actually by using eons, so by using the dynamic adaptive sampling, we can reach the plateau of roughly 5.6 megabases uh, quicker than by not using any adaptive sampling at all. And if we look into 
uh, into this a bit more detail and use a different uh, definition of the contiguity, which is to take the longest single alignment between assembly and reference replicon. We can uh, check the contiguity in terms of percentage compared to the ground truth. So here we have the chromosome of the bacterium, and we can see that eons manages to achieve 100% contiguity much faster than by not using uh, adaptive sampling. Uh, in fact, it's about 29% earlier that we reach uh, similar levels of variation in the contiguity. And if we look at the plasmids, we can also see some interesting effects here, where, for example, one of the plasmids was only constructed faithfully by using adaptive sampling, whereas uh, some replicates of the uh, non-adaptive sampling sequencing actually misassembled another plasmid. And if we have a look at longer plasmids, we can see that some of those are actually also assembled quicker than by not using any adaptive sampling. To summarize, uh, in the second part of the project, we're adapting the framework for dynamic adaptive sampling to genome graphs. We define uncertainty in a slightly different way and therefore focus the sequencing on extending context and achieving uniform coverage across the assembly. I've also uh, shown some results from in silico sequencing um, to use the NOVA assembly for bacterial genomes and how we can achieve higher contiguity and more reliable assembly of plasmids and therefore also reduce time to answer. And finally, a big thank you to my group at Embo EBI and to our collaborators at the University of Nottingham. And thank you uh, to all of you for your time.